Hi guys, welcome to my channel. If you're new here or if you're a returning viewer, welcome back. So for today's video, I thought I'd do a book review of um, a book that I actually just recently reread, which is Carlson's Guide to Landscape Painting by John F. Carlson. And this is published by Dover Publications. Um, I originally got this book in 2020. And I think since then I've read it twice and then just last week, um, no actually yeah, I think just a couple of days ago I recently reread the entire book again. So I thought I'd share with you guys uh, more of an in-depth review of this book which I usually don't do a lot of. Like I do a lot of book flip throughs but not really a lot of like um, standalone book reviews so I thought I'd do that today. And what I'm going to be doing is actually I think uh, I'm going to be flipping through the book while giving you guys uh, my opinion about it, what I learned from each chapter that um, this book talked about. All right, let's do it. Okay, here we go with the, <clears throat> sorry, with the book flip through. Um, I just want to let you guys know I don't script any of this stuff, so <laughs> I don't know how this is going to go. But anyways, let's just start. So cover. All right, so for the table of contents. This says here all the chapters. So um, yeah, so as I go through the book flip through, I'll be talking about um, what each chapter contains. And yeah, just to give you guys a heads up as well, this is a black and white book. So all the plates are in black and white. And I've mentioned before in my other videos when I mentioned this book that uh, that's my only complaint about this book is that the plates are all in black and white. But I will say that um as uh, as we go along through this book clip through you guys will see how amazing john carlson is because even when his paintings are in black and white you still s can feel the sense of um what he's talking about and anyways yeah like uh, i guess yeah we'll just go through it uh yeah as i talk along uh, as i talk uh, about the chapters you'll see what i mean so introduction is by howard simon and this one just talks about uh, John Carlson's background as an artist and uh, ends up talking about his um, uh, uh, like I said background and how he ended up teaching other art students League of New York and basically what this book is about and what it's going to be telling us as a, as a reader so very it's a it's a it's a good short read so and then now we start off with chapter one how to approach painting so as you guys will see here there's a plate like i said for most of the chapters and i um i actually recommend you if you get this book to read what's underneath the the paintings as well because uh, even though most of it are mentioned in the actual chapter it's uh, it's still good to read about this little nuggets of information i guess so this one i guess i'll, I'll tell you guys what uh I basically underlined on this book because I pretty much annotated the whole, the whole book and it's a I think every page has a, a lot of underlined stuff which really shows you how even though this is not a thick book it's jam-packed with information and I honestly think that every sentence even when it's dense is very informative so for this one uh, basically he just talks about how he approaches painting and what I underlined here is uh the only way to study is to practice and that's uh an underlying theme with most uh with the whole with this whole book sorry yeah which is basically just uh you you don't really learn art by reading it right which is you know you have to go out there and actually do it so here he even has a recommendation for how you should study art um he talked briefly here about uh, the classical way of thinking and he doesn't think it actually takes that long um, like three years most of the ateliers right three four years he thinks it doesn't take that long to actually learn the techniques and the basics he says here uh, three months of study from the block hand or head or figure suffices to give the student a good knowledge of form as expressed in a mass chiaroscuro blah 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 and then after that, you just go out there and basically paint from life. I think that's basically what he was saying here. And here, what I underlined, study direct from nature. And right here, what did I underline? 
It is what you are going to say on the canvas that is all important and that how you're going to put on the paint or handle the thing. You know what? Actually, I think if I go through everything I underlined, we'll be here for hours. So yeah, I'm just going to talk about the basic, the basic gist of each chapter, I guess. And here he talks about what he calls landscape sense. Well, he'll be discussing more later. And yeah. Chapter 2, The Mechanics of Painting, which is basically he talks about uh, like the materials and stuff like that. So here he recommends that all beginners start with oil painting and not watercolor because watercolor is very hard to master. And that the easiest way to just start learning is to start off with, uh, with painting. So he even talks about canvases. And here he talks about the palette and uh, the colors that he recommends. All right, and then he talks about medium, which is basically what he uses. What he used is a mixture of half-half um, turpentine and oil of copal varnish, not picture copal varnish. That's what he says. So, and here, colors. He talks about his preferences. Uh, he, he actually doesn't like alizarin crimson too much, uh, but he recommends a rose matter, I think, yeah, for... And then lead white uh, or a mixture of small zinc white with lead which is what he recommends I know lead it's uh, we don't uh, see a lot of lead paints like white lead paints now I think only Rublev uh, is the one I can think of offhand that still has uh, lead white and then bleaching varnishing retouching brushes he talks about all that wonderful stuff yeah, well, texture, scumbling, cracking, use of a finder, and making of panels, and all that nice stuff. And then now, chapter three angles and consequent values. So, this one is where he talks about his theory of angles, which is right here. Uh, he talks about the four prime planes of the landscape, which is a flat line plane, the upright plane, the shine, the slanting plane, and the apparent arch of the sky which is a source of light and then number five is the observation point this is probably i think uh the most important i think most important chapter or as a beginner anyway if you know if you're new to landscape painting and this one this page here uh he talks about basically like how he would do everything for us in blocks and here you can see oops sorry here is the the sky slanting plane upright plane and then the ground so you can see the the colors basically the darkest being the upright and then the lightest being the source of the light and then here he he does a like as an example he did the values just in the poster like flatness and then here where it's more, um, he introduced values, I guess. Yeah, introduced values into the flat values. Very informative. Yeah, so it's a really great chapter. Highly, like I said, it's, um, I think I underlined a lot of stuff in this chapter. Is it the, almost like the whole thing? Yeah. Uh, he does say that for the, that, that rule that he, he talked about, that's basically ordinary landscape in an or, ordinary everyday light. And that obviously there are exceptions. Yeah. See, as you guys, here, I'll show you what I mean. Like, basically, it's almost like, like this whole thing here. They're very important. So... <laughs> This book, it's uh, he even suggested it's not something you just kind of read through in one go. Like it's something you kind of have to slowly read through to absorb everything. Uh, but yeah, like oh, how I did it, I think I read it through from beginning to end the first time, and then the second time, um, like whatever, I just needed some sort of inspiration, or you know, I needed I was stuck in something, and then the last reread I did, which was just a few days ago, I reread the whole thing again, really, and that's just more for inf uh, inspiration. So, oh my god, sorry, you know what? I am taking my time, so I will try to do this a bit faster. Now we're talking about the sign. 
pattern of different values. So basically here, the gist is that he, you know, which is something I think that um, most of us have read, which is symmetry, aesthetic, variety is dynamic. So if you're going to do, um, like, the way he did it, he did design differently than composition. So he has a different chapter for that. But basically he says that, yeah, like here, here's an example of how this is like a, a boring, um, uh, what do you call it? In, in terms of dividing spaces and this is more interesting like this too right so so what did i underline here different proportions or variety of shapes and sizes is a requisite of decoration okay so all the diagrams really are very informative because it really shows what he's talking about and now we're talking about light uh, when we speak of light, we mean the enveloping, radiating, diffusing something that transmutes our everyday world into a livable and beautiful place. So the light, uh, he has a chapter on light and then a chapter on color, as you guys will see later on. We, we do not paint exact colors, we paint them as they impress us differently every day. Yeah. Uh, the smaller the dark mass presented against the light, the lighter and fainter becomes the dark. Okay, then here talk about sky holes on trees. He has a, actually a separate chapter on trees as well. Aerial perspective. Okay. Uh, the first fact is that you shade or cast of any color mass is separable from its weight or value. And then here, the, all colors become cooler as they recede from the eye except white. A cool color is one that has a preponderance of blue in its makeup. Pure blue being, of course, the coldest. The warm color is one made up of yellow and reds. And yeah, here he talks about the degree of art in a pictorial sky. And he talks about, you know, the uh, effect of atmosphere on light. And he basically, it's almost scientific in some parts, but it's also like how he interpreted it as a as an artist, like how the scientific information is translated for us uh, our artists, basically. Like how it's important to us as well to know it, you know? Okay. As you guys will see, there's a lot of text, but I promise you all this text is very important, very informative, like I said. So don't be intimidated by by all the the paragraphs that you see. It's very easy to read as well. It's it's written as if he's just talking to you, um, uh, Mr. Carlson, right? So here now we're talking about linear perspective. So here he says, aerial perspective is a color diminution towards the horizon. Linear perspective is a proportionate diminution of sizes or forms toward the horizon or distance. Then he talks here about the painter's perspective, which is basically uh, a kind of, like he, he explains here, it's kind of visual perspective based upon scientific perspective. So, there you know, he talks about, yeah, here when a mountain obstructs our view of the horizon the arching or receding sky ignores this and proceeds back to the real horizon although it is out of our vision and this is such a great example of um uh perspective on semicircular and curvilinear groups here he talks about trees but uh, like i said there's a separate chapter for that and this one, this is such a great example, like, of how uh, he explains uh, perspective on trees. Uh, he said, you know, you wrap it almost like as a balloon with horizontal lines. And then you'll see how uh, the perspective changes, right? How the, the horizontal near, near the ground gradually becomes elliptical as they approach the top of the tree. And that really affects how you would paint it. Chapter 8 is color and its emotional value in painting. 
here i really like this this is something as well that he always um like he talked about throughout the book which is uh not to copy but to interpret right he says here we must not train our eyes to copy tone for tone but rather our brain to think with think with your heart and even with um what was it he was talking about in other sections not just with color but like you know if you have to move a tree or something to improve the composition do it you know don't copy because he even says that you know if you just want a, a direct copy of what you're seeing just take a photo of it right but as an artist it's um it's almost like our job to kind of impart to the audience our emotional reaction to what we're seeing and you know the hopefully the for the for the viewer to feel what we're feeling right so he says just just do that don't be like a, a slave to copying and here it talks about the the triads you know primary secondary colors and i know it's really kind of ironic that even on the section on colors all the plates are in black and white but what's amazing is that you get the gist of what he's talking about even in this monotone painting like it's really quite amazing to me how how I, it also really shows how how great his paintings are i mean i'll try to insert some of his paintings here that are in color but you will see that even in black and white it translates so well which is really i think you know a, a testament to how how uh, his composition and color choices and values are really great like you know not just as a teacher but as an artist he really was able to impart that right so now section and trees i this is a i think i've read this chapter quite a few times because i have problems painting trees when um i try to do plain a plain air before they always look so dumb honestly so and sometimes i you know even though i've read this a few times i forget right like so it's good to really quite reread a lot of this art book especially those that really touch you or like really imparted something with you because if you just need inspiration like here um five or six understood sky holes can establish a tree minus all the detail and it is so true like look at this like you can tell right away it's a tree just by its shape you know like you don't have to um draw every leaf or whatever right like the simpler the better if it's uh but as long as it's translated to what you're trying to sh show anyways <laughs> i am babbling anyways here chapter on clouds talks about cumulus stratus cirrus and nimbus and he says that for you know for you to understand trees and clouds and to paint it really well you have to kind of like really know what they're about you know like um and he for clouds he really emphasizes or emphasized um, the importance of showing its lightness and its movement and how you do that is you put the strength in the rocks and the trees and everything on the on the ground right to make sure that your uh clouds look airy basically like he says other stuff obviously but that's the main gist that i got from that chapter and now here chapter on composition the expressive properties of line and mass the way he talks about composition like the design chapter is more technical but the composition i find is more like a very romantic kind of explanation how he does it so here a work of art in paint should be beautiful and expressive as abstract color and form and should interest and should not interest us necessarily in any story outside of itself or else it belongs to the field of illustration all right here it talks about different kind of lines the somber upright line tragic disturbed line sublime of curved line all right the main line and theme is chapter 12 and here when he talks about line he says by line in a picture is here meant that the quality of having a beginning a main body and an end and he talks about what he means by that so here like he talks about a arrangement like how something like this i don't know if you guys can see 
No, it's not very clear, I don't think. Like, it's such a weird composition because the foreground, it's, um, like, the person who's supposed to be the focus is on the foreground. It's, like, cut in half. So, he explains it really well, actually. So, uh, I don't think I'm doing justice to it. But, anyways, almost done, you guys. So, here he recommends that, you know, um... I recommend that the student make numerous rough mass drawings in charcoal from imagination of figures and landscapes to develop the feeling for this ryth rhythmic arrangement in the abstract. The Extraordinary and the Bizarre, which is uh, chapter 13. And here he talks about not just painting something that's like something extraordinary to you, but that he says, you know, you really find beauty in a lot of everyday stuff that we take for granted. And as an artist, it's our job to show how beautiful these things are, right? So he says here, don't be a tourist painter. You know, we're like some some people they would just go to different places but they the way they paint it's like they're still painting the way they would paint something in their backyard or something i don't actually i don't think i'm doing a good way of explaining it but uh let me see here a great man can work can make a work of art any objective material inspiration he chooses but it would be in spite of, rather than because of the subject matter being extraordinary. We run 2,000 miles to see one of the nine wonders of the world, while right under our own eyes, perhaps in our own backyard, something transpires that is worth nine times nine wonders. Here he just talks about the different examples of wild compositions, he calls it. And last chapter is painting from memory, which is something he highly recommends. And he talks about here how, um, like, a Japanese artist, that they would actually, instead of painting where they are, they would go to the place and then um, uh, go back to their studio and paint it. And then if they didn't, feel like they got it right they go back to the place again instead of actually painting there um yeah which is something i've you know i've always kind of had the idea of just painting like plain air right like finish what you start but here he's he actually recommends uh painting from memory as well and i know i'm not explaining that really well but <laughs> but that's the gist of it basically how it's also important not to just paint uh from location but also like uh, paint from your imagination in a way you know just or not imagination but like from your memory and that is it oh my goodness that's like 20 minutes of just me yapping but i hope you guys um just uh got the gist of what i'm talking about and how i really love this book highly recommend five stars out of five um i honestly think if you can only get one book on landscape painting this is what i would recommend Carlson's Guide to Landscape Painting by John F. Carlson. It's an old book, but still filled to the brim with information that you can use from as a beginner artist or even as an advanced artist. Okay, that is it. As always, thank you, thank you if you've made it this far. And as always, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to comment down below. Don't forget to like and subscribe. All right, bye guys.